Hey there, are you ready to learn how to build a powerful convolutional neural network that can learn to play chess like a pro? In this video, I'm going to guide you through the process of creating a CNN using PyTorch and show you how it can learn from human chess games to improve its skills. We will cover how to download data from Kaggle directly into Colab, how to parse games in chess notation as matrices ready to enter a model, how to create a PyTorch dataset, tricks to improve CNN training, and much more. Before we get started, I want to make sure you have a basic understanding of deep learning and PyTorch syntax. If you've already built an MNIST CNN before, you're good to go. If not, no worries, just take a quick look at some YouTube tutorials on MNIST and CNNs with PyTorch, and then come back to join us. Let's get started. To start, open a new Colab notebook and run a GPU runtime. This will ensure that your CNN can train and learn quickly. Next, you'll need to upload the Kaggle.json file that you can get from this video description. This will allow you to easily download datasets from Kaggle directly into your notebook. Now, let's get the chess games dataset using the following code snippet. This dataset contains all of the chess games that our CNN will use to learn how to play. First, install the Kaggle package. Now, create a folder and copy the JSON file inside it. Next, download the chess dataset. The name of the dataset is from the URL of the datasets page on Kaggle, and a link for it is in the description. Lastly, unzip the dataset. In addition to the usual data science packages like NumPy, Pandas, and PyTorch, we'll also need the Python chess package to help us create and manage the chess game. This package will allow us to create a chess board, handle the pieces, enforce the rules, and more. To install the package, simply run the following command. With the package installed, we're ready to start the most difficult part of any data science project pre-processing the data. Let's get started. First, we need to take care of a small problem. The columns of a chessboard are notated with letters, while the columns of a matrix are notated with numbers. To handle this, we're going to create two dictionaries, one to convert from chessboard columns to matrix columns, and another to do the opposite. This will allow us to easily move between the two representations as needed. Now we can think about one of the major obstacles between us and training the CNN. How to represent a chessboard to a neural network. Remember, a CNN generally can only accept tensors, 2D or 3D matrices, that contain nothing but numbers. How can we convert the notion of a Bishop or a king into a mathematical object? When representing a chessboard position as a matrix of numbers, one approach might be to simply assign a unique number to each chess piece. For example, we might use 1 for a white pawn, 2 for a black pawn, and 4 for a black knight, and so on. However, this approach has a problem. It doesn't reflect the relationship between the pieces in a way that's conductive to learning. When we assign the white pawn a value of 1 and the black pawn a value of 2, we are essentially telling the network that a black pawn is twice as something as a white pawn. A more effective approach, which is often used to teach neural networks how to play board games, is to take advantage of the fact that CNNs can process 3D input. Each input feature map will encode the location of a different type of game piece. The first map will represent white pawns as ones and black pawns as minus ones. The second map will record the position of white and black knights and so on for all of the different piece types. This way, the neural network can learn the rules of the game and make strategic moves based on the state of the board. For example, for the starting board, the first map, representing pawns, will look like this, while the second one, representing knights, will look like this. Now let's see how we can transform the raw Kaggle dataset into this type of representation. 
we will start with a high-level function that takes a board object from the Python chess package and converts it into a matrix that represents the information of the board. Each piece type is represented by a different letter. We'll loop through them, create a feature map for each type, and then combine them into a single 3D tensor. This tensor will be fed into the CNN. Let's dive into the create rep layer function, which takes the board and the type of piece we want to encode. The first thing the function does is to get the string representation of the board, which looks something like this. Each piece is represented by a letter, and the different colors are encoded by whether the letter is capitalized or not. Now there are four regex replacement operations. First, we replace anything except our desired piece and the line breaks with a dot to clear the board from anything we do not wish to encode in this feature map. Now we replace the lower letter black pieces with minus ones and the white upper ones with ones. Lastly, to create our matrix, we replace the dots with zeros. Now all that is left is to loop through the lines, split by white spaces, replace string numbers with actual integers, and stack it all into a NumPy matrix. Now that we can represent a board state, we also need to figure out how to represent a move. Normally, the output of a neural network that's used for classification is a vector with zeros for the incorrect classes and one for the correct class. But this traditional design won't work well here because the number of legal moves varies from board to board. On top of that, the index of a move on the vector holds no information about the move itself, which is not ideal for learning, as it is not utilizing the CNN's ability to capture positional information with kernels and feature maps. My solution is to represent the move using two matrices. One encodes which piece to move, and the other one tells us where to move it. First, we need to convert the move the function receives as input into a more convenient format. The moves in the data set are in a format called standard algebraic notation, which is a bit complicated, but the important thing is that we need to convert it into the UCI format. UCI is a very simple format that uses four numbers the column and row where the piece starts, and the column and row where it ends. For example, the move d4e5 means take whatever piece is in column d, row 4, and move it to column e, row 5. Once we have the move in UCI format, we can use the chess to matrix dictionary we created earlier to convert a 0 into a 1 in the position the piece moves from. We also flip a 0 to 1 on the other feature map, where the piece moves to. There is one more thing we need to do before we can assemble the PyTorch dataset, break down the game into individual moves. The raw dataset provides the game in the following format, as a sequence of standard algebraic notation moves. To make this easier to work with, we can use the create move list function to substitute each number followed by a dot and a space with an empty string, and then split it by white spaces. This will give us a list of moves that can, we can loop through and convert into the matrix representation we discussed earlier. Now let's put everything we've discussed together. We we'll start by loading only the columns we need from the chess dataset. And then we we'll filter it by minimum ELO rating. ELO is a measure of the player's skill level. The higher the ELO you choose to filter by, the less data you'll have to train with. So there's a trade-off to consider. Do you want to use more data and potentially include weaker players? Or do you want to use less data but have higher quality games? To save RAM space, I delete the games that doesn't meet the minimum ELO criteria. I use the GC module to clear the RAM of the deleted data. After the filter, I don't need the ELO column anymore, so I delete that too. I also cleaned up games that were too short or contained characters my code couldn't handle. In the end, I was left with over 800k games, each containing many moves. If you've never used PyTorch's dataset and data loader classes, prepare to have your life changed forever. 
These classes make it super easy to create random batches of data and loop through them while still giving you complete control over the data. Trust me, it'll make your life a lot easier. The dataset class has a very simple general structure. First, the init function, where the raw data goes in. Second, the len function. This returns the number of training examples in the dataset. And lastly, the getItem function. This function takes an index and returns the training example at that index. This is where all the action happens. You can do whatever you want to the raw data and return the result. Let's start with the getItem function. Since finding the exact move at a given index would require looping through all 800k games and counting the number of moves in each one, I decided to take a different approach. Instead, I pick a random game each time and then pick a random move from that game. This way, I don't have to keep track of all of the numbers of moves in each game, which makes the code a lot simpler and the dataset loading time much quicker. We use the functions we discussed earlier to convert the board state and the next move into their matrix representations. There is just one subtlety to address. If the move index is even, which means it's Black's turn to play, I multiply the board matrix by minus one. This way, the CNN always knows that it needs to play the pieces that are represented by positive values. Since I pick random games and moves, I just put a random large number as the length of the dataset. Since I used 40k, the dataset will sample 40k random moves before declaring there is no more data. Of course, next time it is used, it will sample different games. Here is the full dataset class. You can initiate the dataset and the data loader with the desired hyperparameters. Notice the data loader will shuffle the dataset each time. I just wanted to show you this option, but it is not necessary here since the games are randomly selected anyway. The drop left argument will drop the left mini batch if there is not enough examples to create a mini batch with the correct size. Now let's create the neural network. As I mentioned earlier, it will have convolutional layers. In addition to that, I'll use some common techniques to improve the training process. We'll start by defining the building block module of the network. As you can see, each module contains two convolutional layers, two batch normalization layers for improved training, and two silo activation functions that typically give great results. On top of that, the forward function contains a residual connection. The input is added to the output, which has been shown to improve the training process. If you want a separate video that goes into more detail about how batch normalization or residual connections work, or why do they work, let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to get working on it ASAP. We use this module as a repeatable part of a whole network. Aside from an input layer and an output layer, the whole network is basically several modules one after another. Note the usage of the NN module list to efficiently create several modules. If you use the regular list, the parameters of the module will not be recognized by the overall network and will not get updated during the training process. And that's basically it. The training loop is very basic. The only thing unique about it is the fact that I used separate losses for the two feature maps of the target. The reason for it is that the output of the network should be interpreted as two separate probability distributions, one for which piece to use and another for what to do with it. Since the cross entropy loss is meant to work with a single probability distribution, we need two of them to handle the two output probability distributions. The last thing before getting to the results is how to pick a move. It's not as straightforward as just taking the highest probability position from each output feature map. What if the best move by the network is actually illegal? Also, what if we want to insert some randomness into the process, so if it plays versus itself, the game will be different every time? Also, can we improve it a bit using some handcrafted functions? First of all, to help the network a bit, we can add a simple function that checks if there is a single move made possible. If there is, we play it. 
without the network having a say in it. This is how we make sure it does not pass on a clear way to win. The implementation is easy with the use of the Python chess module. Just loop through the legal moves, and if any of them results in a checkmate, return the move. A fun exercise is to use this function recursively to check for two moves forced mate. I won't show it here, but it's not that complicated and makes the AI even stronger. Another useful function takes a list of numbers and converts them to a probability distribution. We first apply the softmax function, which gives us a distribution, but then we take the distribution to the power of 3 and normalize it again. This increases the gap between high and low probabilities, so bet moves are chosen less often, while still maintaining some randomness in the process. Now we can look at the overall move selection process. First we get the list of legal moves, then we check for single move mate options, afterwards we convert the board into matrix representation and make a prediction, then for each unique legal starting position we take the value the network assigned to it and make a move from that position. These values are converted into a probability distribution and sampled from. The next part, where to move the piece we chose, is carried out by taking the maximum probability legal move from the second feature map. And that's it! Now let's see how the network plays after only half a day of training on a single chip GPU against itself. While you watch it play, few final remarks. First, I didn't show it here, but always remember to use a testing dataset to make sure you are not overfitting. Also, with some more training time, the network can be much stronger. One way to potentially make the training faster is to handcraft more input feature maps that, that contain information known to be important. Checks, for example. If any of you decide to try it, let me know how much it helps, because I'm curious. As you can see, the network plays quite well. It blunders from time to time, but I'm satisfied with the results given the amount of computing power and training time restrictions I had. With more resources, I would use reinforcement learning to get the network to improve even further. If you made it this far into the video, please consider leaving a comment and subscribing. It really helps me out and makes all of the hours that go into each video worthwhile.